Hi everyone, uh, we'll read the final part of chapter 5 and find out what Mole and Ratty are up to in Mole's house uh, whether Mole's cheered up a bit because he was very sad when he was looking for his house So, then while Rat busied himself fetching plates and knives and forks and mustard which he mixed in an egg cup the Mole, his bosom still heaving with the stress of his recent emotion related somewhat shyly at first but with more freedom as he warmed to his subject how this was planned and how that was thought out, and how this was got through a windfall from an ant, and that was a wonderful find and a bargain. And this other thing was bought out of laborious savings and a certain amount of going without. His spirits finally quite restored, he must needs go and caress his possessions, and take a lamp and show off their points to his visitor, and expatiate on them, quite forgetful of the supper they both so much needed. Rat, who was desperately hungry, but strove to conceal it, nodding seriously, examining with a puckered brow, and saying wonderful and most remarkable at intervals when the chance for an observation was given to him. At last the rat succeeded in decoying him to the table, and had just got seriously to work with a sardine opener, when sounds were heard from the forecourt without, sounds like the scuffling of small feet in the gravel, and a confused murmur of tiny voices, while broken sentences reached them. Now, all in a line, hold up the lantern up a bit, Tommy, clear your throats first. No coughing after I say one, two, three. Where's young Bill? Here, come on, do. We're all in a waiting. What's up? inquired the rat, pausing in his labours. I think it must be the field mice, replied Mole with a touch of pride in his manner. They go round carol singing regularly at this time of year. They're quite the institution in these parts, and they never pass me over. They come to Mole End last of all, and I used to give them hot drinks and supper too sometimes when I could afford it. It will be like old times to hear them again. Let's have a look at them, cried the rat, jumping up and running to the door. It was a pretty sight and a seasonable one that met their eyes when they flung the door open. In the forecourt, lit by the dim rays of the horn lantern, some eight or ten little field mice stood in a semicircle, red worsted comforters around their throats, their forepaws thrust deep into their pockets, their feet jiggling for warmth. With bright beady eyes they glanced shyly at each other, sniggering a little, sniffing and applying coat sleeves a good deal. As the door opened, one of the elder ones that carried the lantern was just saying, Now then, one, two, three, and forthwith their shrill little voices uprose on the air, singing one of the old-time carols that their forefathers composed in fields that were fallow and held by frost, or went snowbound in chimney corners, and handed down to be sung in the Maori street to lamp-lit windows at Yuletide. Village is all this frosty tide, let your door swing open wide. Though wind may follow and snow beside, yet draws in by your fire to bide. Joy shall be yours in the morning. Here we stand in the cold and the sleet, blowing fingers and stamping feet. Come from far away you to greet, you by fire and we in the street, bidding you joy in the morning. For ere one half the night was gone, sudden a star was, has led us on, raining bliss and benison, bliss tomorrow and more anon, joy for every morning. Goodman Joseph toiled through the snow, saw the star o oh, ere stable low. Mary, she might not further go, welcome thatch and litter below, joy was hers in the morning. And then they heard the angels tell, who were the first to cry Noel, animals all as it befell. In the stables where they did dwell, joy shall be theirs in the morning. The voices ceased, the singers bashful, but smiling, exchanged sidelong glances, and silence succeeded, but for a moment only. Then, from up above and far away, the, down the tunnel they had so lately travelled, was borne to their ears in a faint and musical hum, the sound of distant bells ringing a joyful and clangorous peal. Very well sung, boys, said, cried the rat heartily. And now come along in all, come along in all of you and warm yourselves by the fire and have something to, something hot. Yes, come along, field mice, cried the rat eagerly. This is quite like old times. Shut the door off to you, pull up that settle to the fire. Now you must wait a minute while we Oh ratty, he cried in despair, plumping down on the seat with tears impending. Whatever are we doing? We've nothing to give them. You leave all that to me, said the masterful rat. Here, you with the lantern, come over this way. I want to talk to you. Now, tell me, are there any shops open at this hour of night? Why, certainly, sir, replied the field mouse respectfully. 
This time of year our shops keep open all sorts of hours. Then look here, said the rat. You go off at once, you and your lantern, you get me. Here much muttered conversation ensued, and the mole only heard bits of it such as, Fresh mind? No, a pound of that will do. So you get buggins, for I won't have any other. No, only the best. If you can't get it there, try somewhere else. Yes, of course, homemade. No tin stuff. Well then, do your do the best you can. Finally, there was a chink of coin passing from paw to paw. The field mouse was provided with an ample basket for his purchases, and off he hurried, he and his lantern. The rest of the field mice, perched in a row on the settle, their small legs swinging, gave themselves up to the enjoyment of the fire, and toasted their chilblains till they tingled. While the mole, failing to draw them into easy conversation, plunged into family history and made each of them, each of them recite the names of their numerous brothers, who were too young, it appeared, to be allowed to go out caroling this year, but looked forward very shortly to winning the parental consent. consent. The rat, meanwhile, was busy examining the label on one of the beer bottles. I perceive this to be old Burton, he remarked approvingly. Sensible, Mole, the very thing. Now we shall be able to mull some ale. Get the things ready, Mole, while I draw the corks. It did not long take long to prepare the brew and thrust the tin heater well into the red heart of the fire, and soon every field mouse was sipping and coughing and choking, for a little mulled wet ale goes a long way and wiping his eyes and laughing and forgetting he had ever been cold in all his life. That plays too, these fellows, the mole explained to the rat. Make them up all by themselves and act them out afterwards. And very well they do it too. They gave us a capital one last year, about a field mouse who was captured at sea by a Barbary Corsair and made to row in a galley. And when he escaped and got home, his lady love had gone into a convent. Here, you, you were in it. I remember. Get up and recite a bit. The field mouse address got up on his legs, giggled shyly, looked round the room and remained absolutely tongue-tied. His comrades cheered him on. Mole coaxed and encouraged him. Rat went so far as to take him by the shoulders and shake him, but nothing could overcome his stage fright. They were all busily engaged on him like watermen applying the Royal Humane Society's regulations to a case of long submersion. When the latch clicked, the door opened and the field mouse with the lantern reappeared, staggering under the weight of his basket. There was no more talk of play-acting once the very real and solid contents of the basket had been tumbled out onto the table. Under the general ship of Rat, everybody was set to do something, or to fetch something. In a very few minutes, supper was ready, and Mole, as he took the head of the table in a sort of dream, saw a lately barren board set thick with savoury comforts saw his little friend's faces brighten and beam as they fell it, fell to without delay, then let himself loose, for he was famished indeed on the provender so magically provided, thinking what a happy homecoming this had turned out after all. As they ate, they talked of old times, and the field mice gave him the local gossip up to date, and answered as well as they could the hundred questions he had to ask them. The rat said little or nothing, only taking care that each guest had what he, had what he wanted, and plenty of it, and that the mole had no trouble or anxiety about anything. They clattered off at last, very grateful and sharing wishes of the season, with their jacket pockets stuffed with remembrances for the small brothers and sisters at home. When the door had closed on the last of them and the chink of the lanterns had died away, mole and rat kicked the fire up, drew the chairs in, brewed themselves a last nightcap of muldale, and, the, and discussed the events of a long day. At last the rat, with a tremendous yawn, said, Mole, old chap, I'm ready to drop. Sleepy is simply not the word. That your own bunk over on that side? Very well, I'll take this. What a ripping little house this is. Everything's so handy. He clambered into his bunk and rolled himself well up in the blankets, and slumber gathered him forthwith as the swathe of barley's folded into the arms of a reaping machine. The weary mole also was glad to turn in without delay, and soon had his head on the pillow in great joy and contentment. But ere he closed his eyes, he let them wander round his old room, mellow in the glow of the firelight that played or rested on familiar and friendly things, which had long, which had long been unconsciously a part of him, and now smilingly received him back without rancour. He was now in just the frame of mind that the tactful rat had quietly worked upon to bring about in him. He saw clearly how plain and simple, how narrow even it all was, but clearly too how much it all meant to him, 
and the special values some such anchorage in one's existence. He did not at all want to abandon his new life, its splendid spaces, to turn his back on the sun and air and all they offered him, and creep home and stay there. The upper world was all too strong. It called to him still, even down there, and he knew must return to a larger stage. But it was good to think that he had come that he had this to come back to, this place which was all his own, these things which were so glad to see him again, could always be counted upon for the same simple welcome. Oh, Old Mole seems a lot happier now. The next chapter is all about the mischievous Mr Toad. I look forward to seeing you for that. Keep safe, keep happy and keep reading. I'll speak to you soon.